What's up Rebels, it is Chunky Monkey 40 here in Philadelphia with the SS United States in the background. Inspired by the service of the British liners RMS Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth, the SS United States was designed to be easily converted from a luxury liner to a troop transport ship in the event of a third world war. With that, the liner's construction was a joint effort between the United States Navy and United States Lines. She was ordered in 1949 and completed in June 1951, measuring at 990 feet in length. To put that into perspective, the SS United States was 110 feet longer than the RMS Titanic. On her maiden voyage, the SS United States shattered the transatlantic speed record in both directions. She was the first American ship in 100 years to capture the Blue Ribbon, which is an award given to the fastest transatlantic ocean liner. Amazingly, the SS United States still holds the record almost 70 years later. The ocean liner will go on to become known as America's flagship and carry a variety of very memorable passengers in her 18-year career, including Sean Connery, Marilyn Monroe, Walt Disney, John Wayne, President Dwight D. Eisenhower, President John F. Kennedy, and future President Bill Clinton. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. But unfortunately, in 1969, the ship was taken out of service due to a rising popularity in air travel. She was brought to Virginia for refurbishing, but wound up sitting vacant and abandoned in port for years. Eventually, the ship was purchased for $12 million, almost became a cruise liner, but then passed through several different owners and then almost became a floating casino, but instead she wound up having all of her interior fittings sold at auction and being sent to Ukraine to be gutted of all the asbestos aboard the ship in the 90s. The Norwegian cruise line acquired it in the early 2000s with another concept to convert it into a cruise liner. And things were looking out good for it until the 2008 recession happened and the NCL wound up selling the liner to the SS United States Conservancy for $3 million. And the Conservancy still owns it to this day. The SS United States Conservancy are actively looking to find a use for the ship so they can get it out of port in Philadelphia and preserved for years to come. This was something special for me to see. I've always had a fascination for ships and so seeing that one is checked off my bucket list. Next, I need to see the Queen Mary 2. Now the Queen Mary was actually converted into a floating hotel and has been operating as one for several years. But just recently, it has been reported that the ship is in risk of not only capsizing, but also going bankrupt. So hopefully I can make it there soon. Yeah, that is definitely something I also want to see. Now we are gonna be heading to downtown Philadelphia and we're gonna go see the original capital of this great country. That's gonna be exciting. Be sure to leave a like and also subscribe for more Traveler videos like this. This is Traveler episode seven. Without further ado, let's get downtown because this is pretty far away from downtown. Whoa, it's right there now. Wow. That is crazy. Whoa, there's a battleship. That is badass. This is the USS New Jersey, launched in December 1942. That is so cool. So this is my first time driving Traveler into a fucking parking garage. Yeah, no, Traveler does not like parking garages. These fucking spots are so fucking small. There's literally nothing in between them. Look at this, this motherfucker, I feel bad, but I tried to back up so that I could give him some room to get into his fucking car, but when I backed up, I ended up hitting this fucking thing. Just a little dang, no big deal, but still, you know? Anyway, we're about to try a uh, Pennsylvania Dutch Diet Birch beer. Yesterday, Tina Marie got me this, so I figure since I'm in Philadelphia, this is my last thing I'm doing in uh, Pennsylvania, Oh shit, I just splattered it all over. Shit. That'll leave a stain. Where's some napkins? See, look, I can't even get in my own fucking truck. Fuck. Nope, no stain, cool. I still got a stain from the oil from the fucking bullhorns on the leather. All right, let's try this mug. Let's see if it's any good. fucks with it. Oh yeah, let's wear a nice shirt just to spill burst beer all over it. 
fuck, man, I am a mess. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. July 4th, 1776. But oh yeah, this country is so racist and always has been, right? There's the Independence Visitor Center right there. It's open right now. Let's go. This is cool. So right when you walk in, you got the gift shop over here. And then I guess as you go further down, there's more. So here's some information about the spot where we are right now in this building. So before Independence Mall State Park was created in the 1950s, this block was covered with large buildings, most of them dating back to the 19th century. When the buildings were removed to create the mall, their basements were left in the ground and covered with landscaping soil. In the summer of 1999, archaeologists dug out some of these basements and discovered five circular brick-lined shafts beneath them. Several of the shafts which had originally been prives, cesspools, or cisterns, I probably bombed all three of those words, were filled with objects that had been discarded by people who lived here in the 18th and 19th centuries. These artifacts in combination with historical documents to help us understand the lives of early Philadelphians. So here's, I guess, some of the stuff that was recovered right underneath this building. Damn. This is kind of cool. So, in Benjamin Franklin's day, books, newspapers, and even paper money were printed on a printing press using lead-type paper and ink. As a printer himself, Franklin understood that the printed words could be powerful tools for spreading ideas. They might even convince people to join in to fight for independence. Here's some of the replica printing plates. So what you would do is you just simply put the piece of paper right here and then just stamp it. I probably should wait till after I do everything to go to the gift shop, but screw it. Let's just go right now. We're right here. Dude, I totally forgot they have a statue of Rocky in Philadelphia somewhere. This Don't Tread On Me hat is dope as fuck. Look at that. That's sweet. I didn't get all that much. I just got this postcard for my dad. Then this Liberty Bell postcard for myself. Not getting too much crazy shit, you know? Gotta save my money for the next month of this journey. And then I also am going to New York City tomorrow and I want to spend quite a good chunk of change at the World Trade Center. We did good, y'all. I only spent five bucks. <laughs> Way better than what I spent at the fucking Gettysburg place. Oh my God. I think I spent like 48 bucks there. Like, holy fuck. Now we're gonna go and see the Liberty Bell, I guess, is in here. So this is the executive branch. Huh. This spot's still like, sort of looks like it's under construction, but I know it's not, I guess. I don't know. The president's house, also known as Master Penn's Mansion, was the third presidential mansion located in Philadelphia. It was used by both President George Washington and John Adams. It was built in 1767, and during the British occupation of Philadelphia, the house was headquarters for General Sir William Howe. It's also the house that Benedict Arnold occupied when he began his treason, after being appointed the military commander of Philadelphia. The foundation of the house was rediscovered in 2010. History lost and found. Archaeologists not only dig in remote places to uncover ancient civilizations, but they also look for artifacts at urban sites such as this one. Look below for the remains of the President's House Foundation using this diagram. That's sweet. It'd be badass if we could go under there. You can see the remains of it right there. Underneath. So this is the line to see the Liberty Bell. So, so by the time I park it, <laughs> and rumor has it, you can just see it through the window up here. <laughs> At least they get to wait in the shade. And then this right here is Independence Hall. <laughs> this is crazy. So this right here is where this great country started. There it is. Independence Hall. I love how they even have the original sidewalk and road. That is epic. Established in 1753 as the State House of Pennsylvania, Independence Hall is the birthplace of the United States of America. It was right here in this building where the Declaration of Independence was adopted and the Constitution of the United States was debated, drafted, and signed. The construction of the Pennsylvania State House started in 1732 and it took 21 years to complete. The Georgian style building still looks basically the same way it did back in the day, but there has been quite a few additions to the building over time. The most notable being the wooden steeple atop the building. It was added to the design around 1750, 
but sadly the original wooden steeple had rotted by 1773 and it was removed in 1781, only to be rebuilt in 1928. This is old city hall. U.S. Supreme Court met here 1791 to 1800. Here we go, we're walking into Old City Hall. Ooh, and it's air conditioned too. Look at the old locks. That is crazy. Too bad you can't go upstairs though, where all the offices were. And this is the store. Oh, that is cool. Whiskey Rebellion flag. Too bad it's sold out though. Unfortunately, tours are not available, but we still can walk around the grounds, so I guess that's pretty cool. We can't go inside any of the buildings. Maybe it's good. That stinks. Yeah. It's so cool to see this building up close. You can somewhat see inside over there. Wow. That is awesome. It's not honestly as busy as I had expected it would be. Unfortunately, there's not really much of anything we could do here except for just walk around and look at the architecture. Which right there, it looks like they moved the window up or something, I don't know. Maybe. That's pretty up there. If we do ever have to replace something, then yes, we are going to use the same material. You will notice we use the same wood and the same nails as well. So that we, do, we do try to use the same building technique. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> that just caught my ear. I was like, that's awesome. Oh, yeah. These steps are sweet. <laughs> Independence Hall. The State House of Pennsylvania. Birthplace of the United States of America. Too bad they got those boards in front of the window, otherwise I'd video inside. It's so pretty though. What is that, marble right there? Here's the statue of George Washington. Sculpted in 1869. Abraham Lincoln stood here when he raised the flag on Independence Hall, February 22nd, 1861. So right here. Standing in the same place as Abraham Lincoln. So Abe Lincoln once saw all of this at this angle. The surrounding areas have changed quite a bit though. <laughs> President John F. Kennedy stood here when he delivered his address on the Interdependence of Nations, July 4th, 1962. So JFK once stood right here. Now we're gonna see the Liberty Bell. <laughs> so there is such thing as a fast pass for the Liberty Bell. You just walk to the fucking window and boom, no line. How cool is that? I guess I'll go in there and look at it. Casted by Pass and Stowe in 1753, the Liberty Bell was originally the bell of the Pennsylvania State House. From constant usage for almost 90 years, a crack in the bell was discovered around 1839. The city retired the bell until 1846, when they wanted to hear it rung for George Washington's birthday. So city workers came in and attempted to fix the bell by drilling holes all the way up the crack. They did that so they could try and prevent the horrific sound of the two sides of the crack rubbing together. This was done as an attempt to get ahead of the crack and prevent the bell from cracking any more than it already was. And they were successful. They rang the bell loud and proud with a couple of thousand people gathered to hear it ring for Washington's birthday until the bell suddenly didn't sound right. That's when they discovered the bell's crack had gotten worse and almost the entire bell was cracked. After that happened, it was permanently retired from being rung. Being that this is the bell that rang loud and proud on July 4th, 1776 to announce the Declaration of Independence, this is a historic relic from the American Revolution. So instead of scrapping the bell like you would a regular broken bell, it became a museum piece, a symbol of American freedom and liberty and justice for all.
Waiting in the line right now. The Liberty Bell is a symbol of the American Revolution. It is a symbol of liberties gained and a reminder of liberties denied. The Liberty Bell's popularity as a symbol of the American Revolution inspired the creation of personal mementos. People prized the metal fillings produced during the 1846 attempt to repair the bell. Made with Liberty Bell metal, souvenirs to wear or display were given as gifts to the government officials and sold to the public. Such as this gold shirt stud containing a piece of the Liberty Bell. And then this walking stick was made with wood from the Liberty Bell. Two preservation efforts are evident in this interior view of the bell. Drill marks extended along the length of what had been a hairline crack. A metal spider installed in 1915 supports and stabilizes the bell. So that's this sort of rib cage type deal. Oh, they traveled it. They took it around the country. What? That's badass. Chief Little Bear, a member of the Blackfeet tribe, photographed at the bell at 1915 Panama Pacific Exposition in San Francisco on the Bell's last national tour. That's kick-ass that they used to drive this thing all around. And then here's some antique relics of the Bell. You've got an antique plate, cardboard fan. Damn, that's crazy. That survived from 1940. And then this right here is a miniature cast pewter toy train from 1986 when they were doing tours with it. Liberty Bell, American Eagle, and then the Statue of Liberty. I'd like to find one of those one day at an antique store. That'd be sick. This is the itinerary of the old Liberty Bell from Philadelphia to the Louisiana Purchase Exposition in 1904. Look at that lamp. <laughs> they really have made a little bit of everything with the Liberty Bell on it. There's Independence Hall right there and then the Liberty Bell at the top. That, I like this chair. That's cool. 1950, yep, 50s, but the chair and the table are from the 70s. Huh. This is the Independence Chair, is the name of that. You have the image of Touch Liberty. Reach out and feel this actual casting of the Bell's famous inscription. Huh. Passing Stowe. So this is a cast of the everything put on the Liberty Bell. Proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto the inhabitants thereof by order of the Assembly of the Province of Pennsylvania for the State House in Philadelphia. So during World War II, the city planned an underground vault beneath Independence Square to protect the Bell from an air attack. And that's it. It's honestly a lot tinier than you really think it is. I thought it would be a lot bigger, I don't know why. But there it is, guys. That's the Great Liberty Bell. <laughs> it's got a beautiful place to chill. <laughs> This has been very real and very patriotic as well. But all right guys, that is it for this video. I hope you guys enjoyed. Unfortunately, I couldn't get inside of the building because tickets are not available right now. I will definitely be doing some research so that I could see the inside of the building. And maybe in the future, I will come back so that I could see the inside in person for myself. But anyways guys, while that's setting out of the way, I am ChunkyMonkey40 at YouTube.com. Stay rebel, y'all. Just some good old boys Never need no harm. It's all you ever saw